Welcome back to Asked and Answered, a series where I tackle frequently asked questions about space and astronomy topics. And today's topic was requested by a viewer. Thank you, Maru, for being a Galactite and a supporter. So here we go. Universal constants. What are universal constants? Well, that's a great question to start with. Universal constants are also called physical constants or fundamental constants or some combination thereof. And these are basically just the physical quantities that describe our universe. They are constant because they do not change over time and universal because they apply everywhere in the universe. So they're constant in both space and time. But there actually isn't really a set definition for which numbers are considered universal constants. How many universal constants are there? Well, again, this is gonna depend on your definition of a universal constant. So the National Institute of Standards and Technology maintains a list of physical constants that's like seven pages long. <laughs> I'll link that below so you can check it out. On the other hand, there are seven foundational constants that are used as the basis for the SI unit system. Now, some consider the universal constants only to be the dimensionless quantities, that is, without units. And if you take our current best understanding of physics, that's the standard model, which requires 25 of those. And if you expand that to our current best understanding of the universe as a whole, which is lambda CDM, then there are 26. What are all the universal constants? <sighs> Okay, so if you take the seven defining constants of SI, they are the hyperfine transition of cesium-133, the speed of light in a vacuum, the Planck constant, elementary charge, the Boltzmann constant, the Avogadro constant, and the luminous efficacy of monochromatic radiation at a frequency of 540 teras. And the values for each of these I'm showing here because I'm not gonna list them all. Now, the 25 dimensionless constants of the standard model are the fine structure constant, the strong coupling constant, the masses of all of the fundamental particles, there are 15, the parameters of the CKM matrix, there are four, and the parameters of the PM and S matrix, there are also four. That adds up to 25. <laughs> and then, of course, the extra constant in lambda CDM is lambda, the cosmological constant. Again, I'm not going to list all the values, but they are here if you are interested. Oh gods, I'm really gonna have to describe all of these now, aren't I? <laughs> okay, buckle up, we're gonna go rapid fire here. So, the hyperfine transition of cesium-133. This is an atom with 55 protons and 78 neutrons in the nucleus, and it's surrounded by electrons. And those electrons have discrete energy states that they can be in. There is a certain frequency of radiation that can cause an electron to move between two really similar energy states, and that's what this value is. <laughs> Speed of light in a vacuum, this is pretty self-explanatory. This is just how fast light travels when there's nothing in its path. The Planck constant. So this comes from quantum mechanics and it basically just defines the relationship between the frequency and the energy of a photon. Elementary charge, this is just the amount of charge that an electron has. Boltzmann constant, this is a constant that defines the relationship between a particle's temperature and its energy. The Avogadro constant, this is a number that is used to count atomic things on a macroscopic scale basically, and if you have an Avogadro's constant of something then you have one mole of that thing and the luminous efficacy of monochromatic radiation at a frequency of 540 times 10 to the 12th hertz. <laughs> this is basically just the total amount of visible light that a source produces given a certain amount of power. And this frequency in particular was chosen for this just because that is the peak of what the human eye can detect. Okay, that's seven down. Let's move on to the 25 constants of the standard model. The fine structure constant, this quantifies the strength of electromagnetic interaction between elementary charged particles. The strong coupling constant quantifies the strength of interactions of the strong force. The masses of the fundamental particles, I'm not gonna go into each of the 15 here, but this is exactly what it sounds like. It's just the masses of all the fundamental particles. I will add a note here that they are considered dimensionless because they are compared to the Planck mass. They range from the smallest, the electron neutrino, to the largest, the Higgs boson, over 13 orders of magnitude. The parameters of the CKM matrix, this is three mixing angles and one phase, and they quantify how quarks change between different flavors. The parameters of the PMNS matrix, again, there are three mixing angles and one phase, but this time they're quantifying how neutrinos change between different types. And last one, the cosmological constant. This quantifies the density of dark energy in the universe. What are the units of the universal constants? Uh, so this kind of ties back to the idea of whether or not only dimensionless numbers should be considered universal constants. So dimensionless numbers, by definition, don't have any units. They're just a number. So for the SI defining constants, these do have units, as you might expect, since they are, you know, the basis of an entire system of units. And I will show here what I showed before, the values and units of each of these. However, keep in mind, if you have a number with units, you can change that to any other type of unit that you want, as long as you keep the dimensions the same. 
So for example, the speed of light in a vacuum is usually given in meters per second. However, you can convert that into whatever unit you want as long as it is still a length per time. So the dimensions of the SI defining constants, the hyperfine transition of cesium is a frequency, so that is a per time dimension. The speed of light is a length per time. The Planck constant has an energy times time dimension. Elementary charge just has a, a charge dimension. <laughs> the Boltzmann constant has an energy per temperature dimension. The Avogadro constant is basically dimensionless. And the luminous efficacy has dimension of luminous flux per power, which is not very intuitive, <laughs> I'm sorry. Are the universal constants changing over time? Well, by definition, no, they are constant, so they don't change over time. If one of these constants was found to change over time, then it wouldn't be considered a universal constant anymore. And there are many attempts to look for that sort of changing over time behavior in these universal constants, but so far there hasn't been any conclusive evidence that any of them do change over time. There are some values that are called constants that are in fact not constant over time. For example, Hubble's constant is specific to the epoch of the universe that we are in. However, this is not considered a true universal constant. Are the universal constants fundamental? Yes, the basic idea behind the universal constants, they are things that have to be measured from the universe. They are fully empirical. They can't be derived from other constants or from theory. If it were discovered that any of these universal constants could be derived from something else, then that something else would become the new universal constant. And scientists are always on the lookout for a new fundamental level of understanding. For example, there are 15 dimensionless masses in the standard model, and it would be really great if we could find a universal constant that tied all of those together, but so far we don't have one. Or also keep in mind that physics has not been able to unify the standard model with general relativity, and if we were able to do that, it would almost certainly affect our understanding of what the universal constants are. What is Einstein's universal constant? Uh, so I think this is referring to the cosmological constant, which is just one of the universal constants. As a reminder, this constant is related to the energy density of the universe, particularly dark energy, which fuels the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. This is tied to Einstein because his general relativity equations originally called for a cosmological constant to make them work in a static universe. However, when Hubble showed that the universe was not static, it was actually expanding, Einstein scrapped the constant. But it made a triumphant return when we discovered that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. And that acceleration of the expansion of the universe is how we know that the cosmological constant must have a positive non-zero value. However, it is very, very small. It is currently estimated to be 10 to the minus 122 per Planck length squared. Why are there universal constants? So the universal constants describe the universe. So the why of their existence is that the universe exists and therefore there must be quantities that describe it. They're kind of just facts about the universe. But if you mean why these particular universal constants, well, that is a whole other question entirely. Are the universal constants fine-tuned? Good question. So fine-tuning refers to the idea that if you tweaked the values of the universal constants slightly, you would end up with a universe that is not compatible with life with us. There are many examples of this, such as the formation of carbon in stars, carbon obviously being very important to our existence, but it's only possible for a very narrow range that wouldn't exist if the strong force and the electromagnetic constants varied by even, say, a percent or so. But whether the universe actually is fine-tuned is still a matter of debate among scientists, and that's a discussion we'll save for another time, another video. <laughs> are the universal constants necessary for life? Possibly. This goes back to the idea of fine-tuning. Could a universe with different universal constants be conducive to life? We know that the universal constants in our universe are conducive to life because we're here, we exist. <laughs> However, that doesn't mean that a universe with different universal constants wouldn't support life. In fact, it's possible that different universal constants could actually be more conducive to life. And also, we only know about our one type of life, so it's really hard to make universal claims about that. So this is still being researched by scientists to figure out what range of universal constants would actually be compatible with life and just how fine-tuned our universe really is. Are the universal constants from God? Yes, it was, it was all leading here, wasn't it? <laughs> well, this takes us out of the realm of physics and into the arena of religion and philosophy. And I'm not here to tell you what to believe, so I will just say that there are those who consider the balanced constants of our universe as a sign of a creator or evidence for God or gods, and there are those who don't. So that's something you will have to decide for yourself. If this is a topic that interests you, you can check out this debate on the subject between the physicist Sean Carroll and the theologian William Lane Craig.
Well, I hope that answered some of the questions you might have had about the universal constants of our universe. And thanks for joining me. I hope you have a good one and I will see you again soon. Bye.